today's show, we've got uh, Luke Dowell here from BP Charge Master, and Luke's going to talk to us about uh, grid infrastructure and charging and all the kind of good work that they're doing at Charge Master. So welcome to the show, Luke. Thank you, Ryan. Um, pleasure to be here um, in the afternoon. So you caught me at the right time of day. Um, looking forward to chatting to you today. Brilliant. So, Luke, if we could just start, um, if you could tell us a bit about yourself and how you got into doing what you're doing now, what's your background? Um, well, it started, I think, like a lot of people, with a, a 555 timer and a handful of LEDs um, at the age of 11. So right. um, I've been in electronics for a long time, um, got the bug early, um, studied it early as well. Um, so I actually went to, went to college when I was about 13. Um, and did a did a course on electronics and kind of you know really for me it was the thing I loved and it was probably the first academic thing that I was really interested in right um so from there um went away and studied a degree in embedded systems um before moving into startups and I spent I guess the first seven years of my career um working in startups on everything from um, sonar systems through to power conversion and millimeter wave um, and even vehicle to vehicle communications um, and that was kind of the first part of my career journey um, and then I guess I got into vehicles um, with yourself <laughs> I guess um, I have to so, declare that uh, so we used to work together in a, a it's, it shouldn't be that long ago, but it's actually quite a long time ago now. We were right at the uh, the early days, the dawn of the uh, electric era. Um, yes, 2010 it was, Ryan. So it's it's been a decade wow. um, <laughs> since we worked together. And yeah, that was where I started working on vehicles for the first time. Um, and we built some prototype cars, everything from city cars through to SUVs and performance cars. Um and yeah, it was exciting. It was a steep learning curve. Um, and it set me up nicely, really, for um, a transition through um, industrial power electronics um, and then into the automotive industry. So I joined Jaguar Land Rover in 2012. Um, I became the senior technical specialist for charging globally. Um, and that was a role in which I really was, I guess, responsible for the strategy, for the, the hardware, the systems, um, yeah, and, and all the commodities that make up the charging system on a car. Um, I did that across 11 different vehicle programs during my time there. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I have to say, um, probably the best thing about that role at that time was when I started, um, JLR really hadn't started to transition to electrification. Um, and I was there quite early in that process. Um, so I got to the privilege of you know, seeing that transformation from the first meeting about the I-PACE um, through to it going up the hill at Goodwood, um, which was fantastic after all that work, seeing the product come up the hill. Um, so really, that's where I cut my teeth in automotive charging. Um, it was six years, it was hard work, um, and it was a big transition period, but it was very, very exciting. Yeah. Um, from there, I, I joined the Dyson Electric Vehicle Program in 2018, um, which for me really was, it was a fantastic opportunity. Um, and it's a great shame, I can tell you that product won't be in the market, but what I can say is that was a fantastic team to, to work with um, and the product itself you know as I think you've seen in the press was very exciting as well so yeah, um, yeah. disappointing it didn't go to market but yeah you know, at the end of the day it, it doesn't take away from I think the achievement of that team um, and, the, and the spirit that that team had um, and yeah some of the things I saw during my time at Dyson um, one in particular, and I don't know if you're aware of this, Ryan, or your listeners, but one of the things that um, Dyson is, you know, really should be applauded for, in my view, is the Dyson Institute, um, yeah. uh, which is where they are have effectively set up their own university. Ah, in Hale. okay. Um, and they are, I can tell you, they're developing some fantastic engineers, um, and they're getting experience that, well, I wish I had 
when I was that age. Yeah, um, yeah. Some great opportunities. So yeah, I wish you know, wish Dyson and my former colleagues all the best. Yeah. Um, and I think you've probably seen some of those people where they've gone to the jobs they've gone into. Yeah. Um, it really was a good team. So a, sh- a shame, but we move on. Yeah. Um, and I moved on to BP Charge Master. So I went from having spent yeah the best part of 10 years on the vehicle side to the infrastructure side um which really is how i got here today and that before i kind of attack you with some questions about what you're doing at charge master like as in you personally day to day and and uh, hardware development and all that kind of thing maybe it'd just be helpful because i've got to admit i kind of when i think about this i think i think i know what charge master does but then actually as I was preparing for this podcast, I was thinking, I'm not really sure, actually, that I do fully know what Charge Master does. So, um, how can you can you kind of run through that? Uh, yeah, so BP Charge Master is the UK's leading EV charging company. So, um, it was founded in 2008. So, just before me and you started working together, yeah. um, and um, it was acquired in 2018 by BP. Yeah. Um, it, it provides charging solutions for um, public charging, um, also for home, commercial, and fleet charging. Um, and it's been in that business and you know, in every part of that business, really, for us for its entire lifetime. Um, so the business has got quite a broad remit. Yeah. Um, the the business as a whole, I would say, is a key part of BP's strategy. So, you, some of you may have seen that earlier in the year, the the chief executive of BP announced that BP's got a target to get to net zero by twenty fifty, um, which is fantastically you know, it, it's fantastically bold for an oil company to be do, to be doing those things yeah yeah there's um, some fundamental challenges around that i would think <laughs> there, there, there are there yeah. are and uh, as a consequence you know we're a big part of that plan um right. and the plan for bp is to get to seventy thousand public charging stations over the next 10 years right um and we have a fantastic opportunity to to play a significant role in this so um yeah it's it, it almost feels a little bit like um when i joined jlr and evs hadn't started at jlr yet right. this feels the same it feels like the business is now making a commitment that we're going to get there and you know to do that here's this whole new industry really that we're going to grow into and so 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 charge masters building out a network of publicly accessible charge points for for electric uh, vehicles in the in yep. just in the UK or more widely so BP charge master is UK focused right. um, but BP has more you know has broader ambitions as well because right. as you know BP is quite present in a number of markets globally right. um, and I suspect that we will be involved in that but our main focus will stay on the UK obviously oh, wow. um, so 70 to, you said 70,000 didn't you so that's global, yeah. Uh, okay. So, global. so today in the UK, we have seven thousand public charges in the network, uh, okay, um, and fifty thousand subscribers for the network. Um, that includes six hundred rapid charges today, from fifty to one hundred and fifty kilowatt. Um, and I can tell you that is at last count because these things are going in the ground. Um, you know, on a day by day basis, we keep growing the network. Right. Um, we also have um, in excess of 40,000 home charges installed as well. Um, so that's a, you know, the other kind of major part of the business is home charge installations. Um, and again, that continues to grow, particularly this year, actually, because EVs have, I guess, bucked the, the, the COVID trend and do continue to grow, which is fantastic. Ah, okay. Um, and it, for, when you for a home charger, then, is that more of a supply of hardware because I, I presume when you when it's a public charger there's it's it's a bit like operating a petrol station you you you're operating a charge station you kind of people come you're getting paid for electricity somehow but for home chargers that's supplying presumably supplying and installing hardware for, for people to install in uh, at, at their homes yeah so it's it's the charger itself um but also we we manage and complete the installation process 
um, in line with the government um, incentives, the OLEV grants as well. Um, so it's more than, I guess, just, just supplying the hardware. We also supply the, you know, the full complete package installation and everything, um, which can be tricky because home installations vary a lot. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing on top of that is we also provide um, digital solutions, say apps and things like that to allow the customer to do things like monitor their usage remotely, um, set schedules remotely and those kind of things as well. Ah, okay. Fantastic. That's really, um, that's really helpful. Um, and, and then, so in terms of your role, you've, you've kind of gone from, um, one side of the, the system to the other, but you, I mean, you're, you're a proper hardware development guy. So what, what are you doing, um, at charge master in terms of the, the hardware side? Um, so my t so my team overall um, we're responsible for um, research and development so product product design and development um, so that includes the development of the home chargers themselves um, mm. and also the public charging solutions as well so AC and DC um, and today the team I'd say is relatively small um, and we we work out two locations in the UK so. Um, most of my team at the moment are actually based in Shoreham on Sea on the south coast in, near Brighton, um, which is fantastic. I love visiting them in the summer, obviously. Um, mm. And we also have the team in Milton Keynes, which is growing. Um, so we are rapidly growing that team at the moment and, and seeking skilled engineers in areas of hardware, software, um, validation, and certification. Um, and we're also building. You know, new test facilities, state-of-the-art test facilities, mm. um, to continue to focus on improvements to our product range, uh, and also, really importantly, new product developments. So, oh, wow. um, yeah, I think very exciting times because the business um, has not, yeah, you know, it's got mature products that are in the market and are in high volume, um, but now what we're looking to do over the next few years is really reinvent our product range. And bring some new technology into this this marketplace as well. Ah, so and because a lot of the the sort of networks really they're they're more like um, installation and operating companies, and they just they buy you know third party hardware. But you guys are you're developing your own uh, you're actually developing your own hardware solutions as well. Or, or would you still use third party hardware for like a big uh, DC fast charger? Um, well, we actually have a mixture. Right. So okay. it, it depends really on the business case. So in in some scenarios, um, particularly where the market is relatively commoditized, it doesn't make sense for us to make huge investments in internal development. Mm. Um, in other areas where we want to deliver a differentiation in the product, um, we will do more internal development. So we, we try to treat it on a case-by-case -case basis as to, you know, what are we trying to achieve? Where's the value in that? Um, so we've got, at the moment, I would say a mixture of third-party hardware um, and new product development. Um, and the new product development is focused on those areas really where differentiating the product is more valuable to us. And can you could you tell us, like, what any, are there any kind of um, things you could give away about what sort of products you've got under development there? What, what's, what's coming? What's exciting? Um, I can't give away anything too much, but okay. what I can say is you can see you can see today if you look at our existing product range that for the for a lot of the high power DC stuff we yeah you know, we have used third party solutions, mm -hmm. um, but we have also developed our own products right. um, in the home charge product and on the AC products they are both in house products today, um, so likelihood is that some of those things will continue to be in-house products and others will be third parties so there'll be a mixture um but like i said we will be focusing on those areas that add value so things that are i guess industry standard which charging is you know quite quite a lot of charging is standard yeah, yeah. um we won't put too much development effort into but things that we can do differently that's where we're really focused um, and we'll continue to focus in those areas. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. So so then I guess there's a lot of like classic, you know, 
design of power conversion devices and like you know because you're talking about some pretty big um pretty big bits of electronics there or you can you can be anyway so there must be it must be some really big engineering challenges to solve yeah yes yes there are but i i would actually say the power electronics is is potentially not the biggest challenge okay um i'd say what some of the biggest challenges really are uh, around interoperability um interoperability and compatibility with vehicles is a is a significant challenge all oh, right okay um, at, as you may be aware or may not be aware um although the charging standards have been in the market for some time um people do tend to interpret them differently when i say people i mean car manufacturers right ev charge point manufacturers um so it can be quite tricky so that's an area that um will get some focus from us so i talked earlier about us building new test facilities and you know that's one of the reasons we're building those facilities is to make sure that our products are compliant and interoperable with those uh, standards. Okay. And this is so in, in what that means in kind of layman's terms is someone turns up with a car, any car, and it should plug into a DC fast charger. But at, at the moment, there are some issues where sometimes the car doesn't recognize the charger or the charger doesn't recognize the car and therefore it won't um, always start the, the charge pattern. But you're working to try and make sure you flatten all those out across every uh, every vehicle basically yeah because we want a consistent user experience and we want a good user experience yeah. um and I, I think yeah i think broadly if you look back i mean take um uh, the sae standard in north america it, it was first drafted in 1997 um the standard has changed and evolved over that time and even though the standard's been out for over 20 years, there are still um, problems with the standards um, and they are still continuously changing. So you know, one of the biggest challenges that we face really is the continually evolving um, world that is charging standards globally. Um, and last time I counted, there were nearly 70 standards globally for charging, which um, when you multiply the number of standards by the number of things that could be wrong by the standard, it can be quite difficult. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which, which actually is why <laughs> you're seeing the car manufacturers are not particularly focused on bringing whiz bang, you know, features at the moment. They're trying to focus on improving the robustness and the reliability in the first instance. Cause actually, if you haven't got that, the customer doesn't care what else you've got. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I, I've heard some of those, um, I've heard about some of those challenges where people where people buy a whatever kind of vehicle and and actually it's a bit hit and miss and it seems to vary from from uh, brand even model to model like some are better than others basically in terms of the success rate but it's um it's quite it's it's a really important um uh, thing that you if you're relying on turning up and getting a charge you kind of need to be able to get you know get a charge yeah. And it's a lot more comp I guess it's a lot more complex than people realize as well. So um, if you look at a DC charging station today, if I take a standard like, uh, say, uh, CCS2, so Combo2, um, there's something like 120 different parameters being communicated between the charger and the car. Wow. Um, and then once you get into the car, and you speaking from the, the, the car side of my experience, um, you, you could have three and a half, four thousand different requirements that have to be met on the vehicle side, yeah, you know, in the different modules like the charger, the battery. Yeah. Um, and then you know, potentially a few hundred system level requirements. So it's it's not really surprising that you run into these compatibility issues. Um, yeah, and, and a good example, for instance, is you know, to the standard and even the the basic standard not even the one that features all the high level communications um yeah you know, the car should wake up when the pilot signal changes in other words when the evsc tells it that there's now power available the car should wake up see what's going on see if it wants to charge and then if it does charge or if it doesn't go back to sleep most of the cars in the market today um don't like that um even though that's what the standard says. So I think it just shows you even the real basic stuff, it can be quite tricky to implement. Wow. And and do you, do you see the sort of onus being on the charger um, hardware or on the 
uh, vehicle hardware in terms of getting that to um, getting that to work better in the future. Where's where's the kind of um, work that needs to be done? Honestly, I've seen it from both sides, oh. and I can tell you today, nobody is perfect. So, <laughs> nice. um, you know, when I worked on vehicles, so you know, I've I've tested um, probably with one car, we we tested about eighty or ninety different chargers. Right. Um, and you know, being on the charger side now, we've tested pretty much every car in the market with our chargers as well. Um, and I can tell you that, yeah, there's problems all over the place. And yeah, this is probably one of the really key challenge, challenges the industry has is about getting to the point where really everybody's implementing things exactly as they should. And consistently. And I, I guess um, it must really help having the sort of... Uh, organization financial clout of someone like bp behind it to in terms of you know putting the, the long yards into solving all of those challenges uh yeah absolutely and i i think um you know, well you know yourself you know, in a startup environment you're very very resource constrained yeah um and certainly for me the, the most important transition that we've got to make as an organization is really starting to drive more robustness into into these kind of things yeah so making sure everything does get tested properly and that we understand where the problems are and the issues are and we we don't just fix our own problems but we we help others to identify where an improvement could make a difference to the customer um so it is definitely a challenge and being able to do things like investing in test facilities is obviously extremely important to that. Yeah, yeah. And so, so, so then, um, in in terms of charging generally, so if if we get into the topic, you know, it, it's often like infrastructure is often touted as being one of the big uh, sort of. I don't know. It's either well, depends on who's talking. It's either an enabler to EV adoption, or it's a significant kind of hurdle to EV adoption. Is getting the infrastructure right, and it it seems like you know there's this sort of couple of different um, schools of thought on on infrastructure but about you know lots of big public infrastructure or more kind of low power um, distributed uh, infrastructure. What what do you see in terms of being the the direction for for the market? Where, where, where do you think it's going to end up? And and do you think there's enough happening in terms of um, it, it it not being a barrier for uh, EV adoption? It's it's an interesting question. Um, it's one that I ask myself regularly. Actually, um, I I, th I think in terms of the overall trend, um, yeah, there will continue to be an awful lot of charging in at home yeah um so charging at home is very cost effective um yeah. the most cost effective way to way to charge a car without question um and it's also the most convenient um it it really is extremely easy to charge a car when you come home and not not even have that hassle of going to um you know fill your car up with fuel like you do with a conventional vehicle um where the the, the key challenge is really is on the high, when people are on the move, the high mobility scenario, um, and that high mobility scenario, you know, really the key challenge there, as we've already mentioned, is reliability. Yeah. So you can have the fastest charging network out there, but realistically, the customers want it to be reliable. In terms of the market right now, um, and what I see from our network of charges, because you know I do see a, f a fair bit of data from the network, I, I would say. One of the really um, interesting things is it, it depends very, very much on where you're talking about. So if you go to central London, yeah, um, where you've got lots of taxis flying around, and lots of them are electric now, thanks to um, LEVC. Yeah, yeah, um, nice product, yeah. yeah. The, the, um, yeah. The infrastructure in those areas can be extremely busy. I mean, I'm talking about charges that have a car connected to them 23 and a half hours a day. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And are doing hundreds of kilowatts a day in terms of charging. Mm, yeah. um, take it to the other extreme. Um, you know, some of our charging hubs will see hardly any um, traffic, um, but they need to be there to give the customers confidence. So I, I think for me, there's, there's a really 
quite difficult balance and it is a difficult balancing act it's a question of putting in enough infrastructure to support the actual need yeah. versus the perception of the need um, and i think a lot of people who haven't lived with an ev on a day-to-day -day basis do have this perception that unless there are charges absolutely everywhere i'm going to be in big trouble yeah um, but i think the reality is there are already a significant number of charges um, in the UK. The, the question really comes down to, are they in the right places? Are they reliable enough? You know, and are they at the right power levels um, yeah. for the use cases? So th there's not a single answer to it, but broadly, I think there is a disconnect between what the customers are saying they want to see versus what they actually need. Yeah, that's it's a good it's a good point that for for passenger vehicles um, from ex, from personal experience, you know we've got um, an an EV, a uh, little Renault Zoe, which we've had for I don't know over a year, and it's I think it's been on public charges three times, maybe four, <laughs> a stretch. You know, most most of the time, ninety nine point nine percent of the time, it gets charged from home. Obviously, we've got the benefit of off road parking, so if you start to then get into areas where there's there's less off-road parking um i guess that that dynamic will change but there's an awful lot of households in in europe let alone the uk where they do have off-road parking and you know that i would think there's probably quite a strong relationship between off-road parking and people who are buying new cars i would think yeah yeah and that certainly is a challenge i think for those people who who don't um, who don't have off-road parking? I think it, it's very difficult. Mm. Is the answer, um, and they're really the people that are going to benefit from the networks growing, yeah, and, and the charging hubs growing. And yeah, you know, this is one reason why I think you might see more charging hubs actually in cities. Yeah, um, is but, which is counterintuitive actually it. at first thought, isn't it? Because you, you'd well, I, I would have think you know charging hubs are more for long distance, but actually now you now you say that. But it, it, I guess to tie into the um, the, the sort of off street parking challenge, I do um, just to say, go off on a little tangent. You know, if, if he's listening, he knows who he is. But one of a good friend of mine has a has an EV. I think he's on his maybe third one now, and uh, he basically couldn't be bothered to get a charge post installed at his house. So he went for several years. Um, you know, he could have had a charge post at home, but because the public infrastructure around where he lived was so good. And he was only having to charge a car up, you know, once a week um, at, at most. He was um, tending to just use public infrastructure all the time, you know. And that's a, I've, I've heard some people with um, uh, with Teslas talk about that as well. Where if they get on the sort of free charging uh, with the Tesla, then they will incline to try and use um, the supercharger network rather than use their own home power, I guess. Yeah, which always surprises me because for me, I would definitely have a charger put in yeah. um, if I was going to buy an EV. If I had the option of having a charger put in, um, more for convenience than anything else, um, it is a lot less hassle. Um, but I have myself come across those, you know, I'd say, um, exceptional customers who um, have something like a Tesla and uh, then they do charge exclusively in public. So it can be done yeah. even today. Yeah, yeah, um, and you sort of you mentioned it in the last question there, but it's um, something that's interesting and and is a probably I don't know more important topic than because for passenger vehicles actually the the charge need unless you're a very heavy user of a passenger car is is pretty low um, you know average journey lengths and and sort of typical mileage that most people are doing even with commuting and stuff is is not not huge and and, and very manageable. But if you get into fleets, um, so a taxi obviously is you know it's a it's a work vehicle. Um, they're doing you know potentially hundreds of miles every day. Um, but you've got things like delivery vans and trucks and buses and and some of these larger uh, fleet applications. Is is that a market that you guys get involved in? Because uh, it's um, yeah yeah. So I would say today you 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 more typically see deployments in in a conventional kind of depot based scenario yeah um so yeah a, a group of you know, chargers installed in a commercial environment and when the vans or, or whatever they are return at the end of the day they can be recharged yeah um 
but I would say that, um, and I think some of our recent collaborations probably demonstrate this, um, that, that 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 may not always be the case. So we're starting to see um, and the Uber tie-up. I don't know if you saw that in the press a couple of weeks ago. We, we have now tied up with Uber for charging infrastructure. Okay. Um, and one of the things we're doing for them is we're actually building hubs, yeah, um, and those hubs will be, um, they'll have areas which are exclusively for Uber, yeah, um, to allow their drivers preferential access to charging infrastructure. Um, but we're also going beyond tying up with them on the the infrastructure installed in the depots and the hubs. We're also looking at how can we help those drivers to charge at home or when they're anywhere else away from you know, those hubs on our general infrastructure so yeah i think it's heavily use case dependent is the answer um and commercial actually is quite a good sector for charging because often the duty cycles and the usage patterns are relatively predictable yeah um so for electrification things like buses or goods vehicles can actually be a really really good use case yeah and and, and heavy heavy energy users um yeah it's interesting actually because a bus you know it's quite it's not easy but in some ways you know a bus or a big truck you know the drivers don't take them home at night so yeah basically it gets it goes out does a job it comes back to his depot unless it's a long haul truck and then it might be out for longer but that's probably not an ev use case quite at the moment so if it's a if it's an urban delivery truck or bus goes out does a job comes back to the depot um you know it might work x number of hours a day like could be one shift or two shifts uh but it'll be parked in the depot for a certain amount of time every day and can therefore be charged um at that at that point and as long as you can get the charge in during that sort of stop time uh you're, you're fine but then the smaller light commercial vehicles you know vans and the taxis you mentioned before they are you know typically the driver's take them home as well so it's part of the the kind of model that those vehicles don't necessarily stay at the depot overnight they uh, not always because it does it does vary depending on who the company is some um some drivers don't take them home some do but you'll see um drivers take them take them home and then i, w- I would imagine for the driver there's then a sort of a challenge over charging at home obviously it's probably very convenient but then you're using power and how do you recharge that? Uh, that's the wrong word to use, but how do you build that back to the company, recover that cost? Um, I've heard people say similar things with company cars as well about charging them at home. How, how do they cover the cost if their fuel's paid for and you don't want to use electricity at home, et cetera. So is that, that seems like quite a big um, kind of use case, but also quite a big challenge in terms of making sure that you can sort all that kind of backend billing out. And that, that is that, um, is that a, a, in the kind of awareness of uh, of Charge Master BP? Yeah, and it is a challenge actually. Some of those fleet use cases you've just mentioned are quite tough because it's almost, I guess, analogous to the old fuel cards, right? Yeah. Um, but the the problem is that it can be quite difficult to control that. Yeah. Um, uh, which is a risk for businesses. So w- what's not quite clear yet is. Um, exactly how I guess some of that reimbursement stuff will work for EVs, yeah. Um, and that that in itself drives the challenge. So if you take the conventional model of a normal vehicle where you would effectively reclaim your mileage, it may not be like that. So we're having to um, make sure we future our products for those use cases as well, um, which some of which will be quite demanding for sure. Yeah, yeah. And is it? Um... Because we, we've seen a few, there's a, one in particular, but it's it's a van fleet where they're delivery vans and they've, they've deployed, I mean, fair, you know, fair, fair play to them, deployed a good number of EVs out in the field, uh, which is great. Um, but then actually it's, it's, it's relating, they obviously haven't quite worked out how they're going to do the charging. So the vans are then finding their way onto public infrastructure quite often, which is then leading to complaints from members of the public who are saying, you know, Company X is blocking up the public charges, um, and and, I, and my guess is that's because of this sort of 
there's a there's, there isn't a good system in terms of um, working out who pays for the fuel and and how the vehicle is is charged and where so there's there's a bit of in bit of uh, logistics to sort out on on that side yeah and i think i think again this is one of the reasons why um the hub model um may well end up being quite popular as well because yeah. um if you if you have um vehicles operating in a geographical area and they have access to these large charging hubs um that may simplify that problem yeah um so i definitely would expect that kind of almost it's almost an away from base charging use case rather than a kind of public charging use case mm. um to to take off in the in the longer term right and um so next, my next question was was about um the sort of fundamental grid infrastructure and and i guess particularly if you're putting a larger hub in place or uh, a big depot charging solution, you know, I, I, I hear it again and again and again. People saying, oh, you know, the electrical grid is going to collapse. We can't possibly, you know, charge all the EVs that we need to charge because there's just not enough grid capacity. Um, do you see the, the sorting those grid challenges out as being a big challenge especially i guess where you're deploying a large number of charges in one in one place so you've got a high power demand yeah so i guess i see sort of three main challenges in terms of grid infrastructure so one is the availability of high power connections yeah so um it's not very often that a high power connection is coincident with the place that you'd really like to put a charger in Right. Um, so that is a challenge, yeah. And the the biggest issue with that is not can I get a power supply there because often you can. It's a question of how much money do you want to spend to, to put a power supply there, yeah. Yeah. Um, so if you look at that, what happens is it ends up driving a significant investment into cabling, transformers, switch gear, etc. Yeah. Now, in turn, that becomes a big increase in capital expenditure which in turn affects the business case for that location. Yeah. Um, and what I think is definitely increasingly challenging today in the UK is finding locations that are coincident with high power supplies that also you want to put a charging station at. So it can be yeah. demanding and it can be very expensive. Um, I think the other thing to know is you really need to guarantee you're going to get utilization before you make these kind of investments the charges themselves can be um tens of thousands even even hundreds of thousands right yeah um and then transformers well a big transformer is serious money as well as is the cabling yeah so so yeah if you look at a garage forecourt a garage forecourt is a similar type of asset right there's a lot of investment in equipment and infrastructure and it can easily run into you know a million quid a million and a half quid to build a garage forecourt. Yeah. Um, I don't think yeah, I don't think it's particularly difficult to see that you can get to those sort of costs very quickly. Yeah. Um, the other aspect to that is your operating costs and your ongoing operating costs. Now, grid connections, if I go and get a um, say a 30 kVA connection, it might cost me a hundred pounds a month. Yeah. Yeah. But if I go and get a 150 kVA connection, it might cost me a thousand pounds a month just for my grid connection. So you've got to sell quite a lot of electricity to recoup the costs of those connections. Um, so really, that's one of the biggest challenges as well. Is it's not just about the can I get a power supply there? It's about the ongoing costs. So you really have to build those charging charging places in the right locations to begin with, and that is tough. Because as I said, there aren't too many of those places out there. Um, I, I guess the third challenge, um, and you kind of touched on it, was about generating capacity. Um, so, in terms of generating capacity in the UK, um, the, the feeling is, and the feeling that um, I hear a lot is, in terms of generating capacity, the UK is not too bad. The bigger problem is the change in duty cycles on the electrical distribution system um, and the effect that will have on the electrical infrastructure in the country. So what that will do is drive either the need for more investment in the, in the um, distribution networks or it will drive the need to incentivize people to 
adjust their charging habits such that the networks can deal with this additional load that's coming. So moving the charging uh, into the sort of off-peak times, basically. Yeah, and I, I think that will very much be a trend in the next few years. I, don't, I mean, I think we're far from being at the point where it's all going to collapse overnight. Yeah. But certainly in the next decade, um, those challenges need to be addressed and they need to be addressed robustly. Yeah. Um, and I do think a bit of it as well is actually the the growth of the EV sector is probably causing this to be a bit of a, a, a bigger issue than it otherwise would have been. Um, certainly that's what I, I pick up is the perceptions kind of changed, if you like, to, oh, we're not quite ready for EVs, to EVs are coming, to, oh, they're coming and we've got to make sure <laughs> that the grid's ready for them. Yeah. Um, and that's been in the last 24 months, right? It's, it's very recent. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah, it feels feels like a very fast turnabout. Now, in in um, in these sort of charging locations, how much of a sort of solution do you see things like? I mean, it's some of these big charging hubs. We see great, you know, big sort of solar canopies and things on them. So, so the ability to deploy like some local renewables and that does is that does that help or is that just kind of does it just look cool basically? Uh, um, I think it can. Hmm. Um, so certainly large scale solar deployment, um, it can help if your kind of peak demand happens to coincide with the sun shining. Right. Um, doesn't necessarily happen all the time. Yeah. Um, it, I think the the other point about you know, integration with things like energy storage, right. um, I absolutely think that will happen. I mean, for the right. same reason we just talked about, right? Yeah, if it's a hundred pounds per month for a thirty kVA connection and a thousand pounds per month for a hundred for a one fifty kVA connection, the business case for energy storage becomes a lot stronger. Um, so I do see energy storage coming into those hub environments in the right. future. Um, how fast that happens, I, I suspect that people are probably more excited about it happening than you know, the speed at which it actually will happen. Um, but for sure it will happen and that is um so pr principally going to be like battery packs sitting sort of in between the grid connection and the the chargers to, to basically buffer the demand to take out the peaks so that it, it'll mean you can effectively like trickle charge a, a local battery pack and then draw down from that when your demand comes your charging hub to, to charge up lots of vehicles yeah, and I, I think it will be localized energy storage, basically. Right. Um, but you know, also, if you look at you know, look at some of the things our colleagues have been doing in North America um, with a company called Freewire um, that BP has invested in. Um, Freewire has um, some mobile charging solutions, um, but also some fixed charging solutions that incorporate energy storage. Um, so these kind of solutions, you can see them coming into the market as well in the future. Okay, cool. Um, and that's, a, I mean, grid, grid storage is something we've talked about a few times on the show with people who do it. So if people are interested in looking at grid storage solutions, if you if you check the uh, the, the library, uh, I'll put a few links below as well to old podcasts with various different companies who are considering different technical approaches for grid storage so that's it's interesting to hear you um talk about that being part of the part of the solution for you guys as well um so so then um in in terms of those three big challenges obviously some of those things are going to be outside of your control uh in terms of of uh fixing what what is it that you are sort of most excited about in terms of the the, the work that BP is doing and, and what you're, you know, is it that you, you're driving sort of lower cost product through or just more higher volume deployments or um, higher power or, you know, what, what's kind of the real um, focus at, at the moment? Um, well, I, I think really for me, it sits in two areas. Um, so the first one is this trend towards smarter charging. Um, yeah, in terms of this, I think it will vastly improve the, the customer experience in the future um so things like um plug and charge so 
you know, potentially in the future, no more RFID cards and no more mucking about with apps when you stood next to a charger. Um, I'm, you know, very excited about that in the future. Um, but also things like um, you know, time sense, you know, time of use or tariff sensitive charging being implemented and integrated properly with the vehicle. Um, you know, those things they may not seem like they're very significant, but actually you'd be amazed how excited the customers are about that. Yeah. Um, because, you know, fundamentally today charging is not, is still not a very intelligent process. Um, so some of these other smart features that are going to bring in optimization of charging schedules, you know, the load leveling integration with, um, you know, other things like, you know, demand response at grid scale and solar and all that kind of stuff is exciting. And that, that for me, I think is going to be the next five years. That's where there's going to be the growth in new features. Um, obviously, I can't tell you exactly what features we're looking at in that area, but I can I can tell you that there's a lot of different things that can be done um, and it will be quite good fun to explore those areas. Mm. Yeah. And it from from a hardware point of view so now uh, just i know we've not got a huge amount of time left but thinking about the the sort of hardware that you're developing uh you mentioned that the the power electronics bit is is almost kind of like the the easy part if you like um but i'm just interested in that you know so, so some of the charges that we're seeing coming out are, are huge you know I, I mean i've seen proposals for sort of megawatt scale um charges you guys are doing more like um, up to the, the ultra level charges, so sort of 350, uh, 800 volt kind of uh, territory. In, in t- inside a, uh, a charger like that, there must be some pretty, there must be some technical challenges in terms of managing that, all of that power and current. Are you, are you finding that they, they are, the designs are progressing with, you know, are, are you, do you need to use things like uh, silicon carbide in those uh, big chargers or, or because it's a, a basically a, a giant thing that doesn't have to move around are you is there, is there a different approach like how how close is what you'd find inside that box to what you find inside the vehicle um i would say it's quite different actually okay. um so in the, say so from working on the vehicle side um obviously weight is extremely important yeah um and <laughs> Weight is a very, a very big challenge, but also cost is very demanding. So, I mean, silicon carbide. Um, I, I've actually never worked on a vehicle that didn't have some silicon carbide in its charger. Right. Yeah. Um, so, compared to to where compared to where we are with things like um, inverters in vehicles, silicon carbide has been in chargers since you know two thousand and ten. Yeah. yeah 2012 so those technologies are deployed and there are some you know fairly interesting circuit topologies deployed in those charges um when it comes to the offboard side it, it's a very different situation so you you're dealing with things that can be bigger and heavier yeah um but you and you don't particularly want them to be noisy and loud right so so we we tend to be you know looking at solutions and if you look at what's out there in the market now we're not necessarily really really bothered about achieving very very high power density because the problem with high power density is invariably you end up needing a big cooling system because you're getting trying to get that heat out of a really small space yeah um for the high power stuff having more real estate is a, a big advantage um and although we can have more real estate there are still limitations on what footprint is acceptable on a garage forecourt. Um, yeah. And that does bring challenges um, in terms of the power electronics. But in general, the approach that we we tend to take is we we look at the, the different architectures. Um, and if, if you look, you can kind of take two approaches. There's this sort of really modular architecture where you have almost a completely integrated AC and DC converter as a module that's easy to replace easy to service if they're small enough they're actually quite easy to change physically um that's a it's a good approach in terms of providing what i would call availability of the charger because if the unit breaks down the charger can still function 
Um, but it has a disadvantage in terms of reliability because statistically it's more likely that one of these, say, 10 units you put in is going to break down. Um, so there's a balance between complexity um, and, you know, or between modularity and, and uh, cost, if you like, uptime. Yeah. Um, that's not an easy challenge. Um, and it's not an easy thing to make a decision on either when you're sort of selecting these concepts. So um, the other approach is there is a kind of halfway house approach as well that we see where, um, and you see this from some of the, the other charging station manufacturers today, they will have large um, AC to DC rectifiers, sometimes very simple devices, mm. um, sort of 12 point rectifiers like you would find in a rail railway system. Right. Yeah. Um, and then they have a bunch of DC to DC converters that are quite small and easy to change and easy to fix. So I think the answer to it is you, you really have freedom to operate. Mm. Um, and what it depends on is the use case. So if you're building a big charging hub, why wouldn't you put a big transformer in and an enormous 12 point rectifier plus some, some additional power factor correction? You can do that, but if you're putting a charger onto a forecourt and you haven't got a lot of space, then you really want something that's small and self-contained. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's heavily dependent on the use case, and we're going to see a range of solutions in that area. Um, indeed, we are, we have a range of solutions. So our 50 kilowatt units, for example, are self-contained. Yeah. Um, they're relatively easy to install. That's one reason why we've got a few hundred of them out in the field. Yeah. Um, compare that to our 150 kilowatt chargers, which are split chargers so all the power electronics are off in one big cabinet hidden away and then the post itself just contains the you know the control electronics and the interfaces and the connectors um yeah that's something that you you can't fit in a small area um so you do need that mixture of different solutions available to you for different environments it, yeah th i guess that, that that having that extra space to play around with but then uh, so here's another one the, the, when you're designing a vehicle, you tend to have quite a well-defined um, accelerated life cycle test plan. And, you know, in a design life for a vehicle that is maybe a, a couple of thousand hours for a passenger car, could be longer for a truck or a commercial vehicle. But when, when you're designing kind of um, infrastructure type assets like these, the, the sort of target lives are, ma are massive, aren't they? Yeah. So you're talking about an asset that's got a 10 year lifetime, at least, if not longer. Mm. Um, it has to be serviceable yeah. um, and maintainable. So you know, in terms of the requirements for those public charges, you know, really installation service maintenance all right at the top of the list. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing, and you know, this is where we really benefit from being in the market for a long period of time is you know, we have had, DC charges in the ground for most of the lifetime of the company. And as such, we've got a lot of data that we can use to help us specify what our charges have to do. Right. Um, and you, you, know, you mentioned about the um, energy storage. So things like how do you specify that energy storage? Well, to do that, the duty cycle and the usage patterns are probably the single most important piece of information, right? in sizing that energy storage and making sure it lasts for the lifetime of that site. Yeah. Um, so really for us, you know, one of the things I'm looking to do with our um, new product developments is make sure that we leverage all that learning we've had and, and bring that into our new product development. Okay. Um, and yeah, everything from when you find a problem, how did you fix it and how are you going to take that learning forward into the new product? Yeah, yeah, which is, I mean, uh, automotive um, world. That's kind of the, the, that design cycle and uh, cycle planning. That that's a big part of the the process there. But I guess it's it's always hard, isn't it, when you're doing things that it's it's you know, there, it's new. <laughs> so you know, there's not like loads of other companies you can go out and just look at exactly how it's been done before. There's a lot of challenges here that are requiring some really clever people like you um, and and all your colleagues to kind of be doing stuff that it's it's uncharted waters you're doing uh, new things all the time so you know i'm very um 
sort of in 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 awe of uh, of of what you're doing down there, and uh, it's you know it's really it's fantastic to see um, see that starting to turn into such a you know huge scale of of deployment of product and and charging infrastructure. So uh, thank you. It, it, it's it's been it's been really interesting uh, talking to you, Luke. It's been great to catch up. Um, thanks for taking the time out this afternoon, Luke. No problem at all, Ryan. Thank you for the opportunity. That's all we've got time for today. Thanks so much for taking the time out to listen to us. Uh, I had really good fun catching up with Luke. I hope you guys enjoyed that as well. Uh, don't forget, if you've got a question, send it in and we'll uh, we'll see if we can turn it into a podcast episode. If you're doing something exciting in the EV world uh, as well and you'd like to be on the show, then, uh, then do get in touch. We'd love to hear from you. Um, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already um, or hit that like button uh, or leave us a rating on uh, one of the podcast platforms it really helps the show get in front of more people we've been doing quite well recently in the the ratings so uh, i'd like to keep that up Um, and we'll be back uh, talking to you again with another exciting episode soon